This is a series about the Dark Ages, when civilization was said to have stopped and ignorance flooded the world. I've been trying to convince you that it didn't happen, that the Dark Ages were a fine era for art. But in this film, I'm going further. The art we'll be looking at in this film is some of the most sophisticated ever made. If any art challenges the myth of the Dark Ages, it's the art of Islam. This is Cordoba in Spain. That's the great mosque of Cordoba up there. And this handy little Dark Age gadget is an astrolabe. Some people call this the first computer. And what this thing does is calculate exactly where you are by using the stars. Islamic stargazers perfected the astrolabe in the Dark Ages to work out the direction of Mecca. So they always knew which way to pray. And it filled their art with cosmic patterns. Later on, I'll be showing you how to use one of these, I hope. But first, we need to travel back in time to the beginnings of Islam to the first fascinating creations of Islamic art and architecture. So right now, we're here in Cordoba, in Spain. And to go back to the beginnings of Islamic art, we need to go right across the Mediterranean to here. Jerusalem, the heart of the religious Dark Ages. What huge dramas have been enacted here what important art has been created. Most of it's gone, unfortunately, but not all of it. Some of it has survived. Notably, that magnificent golden dome on the horizon, the Dome of the Rock. It's one of the most significant buildings ever put up, a piece of architecture that changed history. You couldn't really ask for a more dramatic location, could you? And if you think it looks good from up here on the Mount of Olives, just wait till we get closer. Mohammed died in 632 AD, and for the first 50 years or so after his death, Islam was preoccupied with conquest. The speed at which the Islamic Empire expanded was remarkable. In just a few decades, it went from nothing to gigantic. It was the most dramatic, most aggressive and fastest feat of empire building the world has seen. This is the Islamic Empire just a hundred years after Muhammad's death. Up here, the whole of Spain, all of North Africa, the entire Middle East, as far across as the borders of India. But all this astonishingly successful conquest didn't leave much time for art. Almost nothing survives from the first years of Islam. Clearly, Art wasn't a priority. And then, out of nothing, as if by magic, this appears. The Dome of the Rock. 
Nothing in Islamic art prepares us for this. It's just suddenly there. A definitive Islamic creation seemingly conjured out of thin air. It's like a flying saucer or something that's landed out of nowhere. And something you sense immediately, even from this distance, is the powerful geometry of it. That air of mathematical clarity. And that's something that continues in Islamic architecture. As you can see, it's an octagon. It's got eight sides. And octagons have a special symbolic presence because they combine the geometry of a circle with the geometry of a square. I'll show you. If I draw a circle here, and then two intersecting squares here and here. The shape they form, the shape in the middle, that's the octopus. The octagon is a surprisingly popular Dark Age shape with powerful sacred meanings. If the Earth is a square and heaven is a perfect circle, the octagon is a symbolic bridge between the two. All the proportions of the Dome of the Rock are meaningful. So these walls here, the walls of the octagon, each of those is about 20 meters long and the dome in the middle the height of that is again about 20 meters and the diameter of it is also 20 meters so all these proportions have been carefully calculated and have a purpose it's as if the entire building has been shaped by a divine mathematics and those divine mathematics have given it a sacred meaning. This location, Temple Mount, is the holiest spot in Jerusalem. This is where King Solomon built the first Jewish temple, the one destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar. And then Herod, the infamous King Herod, built the second temple here as well. Herod's temple was made entirely from white marble and was so huge it covered 67 acres of this sacred location. So grand, so pompous, and to my eyes, so inelegant. So the Dome of the Rock sits on layer upon layer of crucial religious history. And when the Muslims conquered Jerusalem, in 638 AD and claimed this site for Islam, they took possession of what is probably the most loaded religious spot on earth. And that's just the outside. For me, this mysterious interior is one of the most atmospheric achievements of the Dark Ages. There's something so haunting about the way the light works in here. The shimmer of the mosaics, the whispers of the calligraphy. Basically, it's a circular shrine. It's not a mosque. It's a place of pilgrimage that's been built around a sacred site. And the site it's all been built around is the site of this holy rock here. The Jews believe this is the rock on which Abraham prepared to sacrifice his son, Isaac. And the Ark of the Covenant is thought to lie hidden somewhere underneath as well. It 
Islam has a different tradition. Islam believes that this is the holy rock from which the Prophet Muhammad set off on its great night journey to heaven. The angel Gabriel came to visit Muhammad in Mecca and brought him here to Jerusalem. And from this rock, the Prophet ascended to heaven. And there, in paradise, he met God. And God instructed him on the Muslim duty of prayer. So this holy rock, like the architecture around it, is a point of contact between man and God. And that's the religious message of the whole building. If you saw the first film in this series, you'll recognize this shape, because we've seen it before. This type of encircling architecture built over a precious site is something we found in the round churches of Byzantium. Remember San Vitali in Ravenna and Santa Constanza in Rome. The Muslim Caliph Abn al-Malik, who built the Dome of the Rock, was deliberately taking on the architecture of the Christians. This round shape, the proportions, none of it is an accident. Abd al-Malik also added an explicit inscription which runs all the way round and which gives the date in which the dome was finished, 691 AD. And it also includes a stern message to the Christians. O oh, you people of the book, it says, meaning the Bible, Jesus is only a messenger of God. God is only one God. It's a deliberate challenge to the Christians. Jesus is just a prophet. There's only one God, and gods don't have sons. This entire building is taking on Christianity. Look at that. From floor to ceiling, it's covered in the most exquisite mosaics. Gold and green. There's a palm tree. and these beautiful jeweled crowns. And all the pieces of the mosaic are set at different angles, so they reflect the light differently at different times of day. And all this, all these glorious mosaics, are intended to evoke a vision of paradise. When you look there in paradise, says the Koran, you will see delights that cannot be imagined. Fruits of every kind and all that you ask for. At a stroke, Islam had invented for itself an unmistakable new architecture. And at the center of this new architecture was a vision of paradise. The Islamic paradise is a green and verdant alternative to the harsh desert landscape in which Islam was born. These are lands where water is precious, and so is hope. Just a few years after the Dome of the Rock was finished, the Umayyad caliphs in Damascus gave the world another wonderful Islamic structure the Damascus Mosque. I think it's one of the most exciting buildings I've ever been in. And look what's on the walls. Inside the fabulous Damascus Mosque, the Umayyad Caliphs set out actually to describe paradise. And to surround the Islamic pilgrim with delightful and irresistible visions of it. It's one of Islam's most dramatic artistic moments. These are the joys that await us in heaven. These are the beautiful cities in which we all live. And this is the water, the cool and endless water that we will drink.
Those magnificent images of paradise in the great mosque at Damascus are like images of a wonderful oasis in the desert with water, palm trees, flowers, everything that's so hard to find out here. And the Islamic paradise promises so many pleasures in the next life to the true believer. All you can drink, all you can eat, and all you can dream of. This is Qasir Amra. It's one of the desert palaces which the Umayyad rulers of Damascus built out here to get away from the city. Its heat and its pressures. No one's certain which of the Umayyad princes chose this distant desert location. Was it the Caliph Al-Walid I or Al-Walid II? What is sure is why they chose this particular spot. Qasir Amra is built in a wadi, the wadi al-Batum. And wadis are desert valleys that fill up seasonally with water. So when it rains in the desert, the precious water floods through the wadi and fertilizes it. Around the back of the building, over here, are various contraptions for channeling this water through the palace. Because, believe it or not, what you have before you here is a bathhouse. Khazir Amra is a bathing establishment in the desert. One of the earliest surviving secular buildings of Islam. The reason we've driven all this way across the desert to find it is because this fabulous bathhouse in the sands has something remarkable inside it. Something you'd never expect to find here. Floor to ceiling Islamic frescoes. A troop of acrobats gives a busy performance. And there's a bear strumming a lute. There's so much going on in here. And a group of statuesque female dancers show off their figures and their beauty. The dancing girls are particularly surprising. We're just not used to Islamic imagery as abandoned as this. But it's important to remember that this is just as old and just as traditional as everything else we've seen. This too is a precious Islamic heritage. A negative way to understand Qasir Amra's remarkable frescoes is to see them as signs of moral relaxation. Away from Damascus, deep in the desert, a wayward Umayyad prince is indulging an appetite for wine and music and women. But I don't think that is what it's about. If we go back to the many descriptions of paradise in the Quran, there are constant references to the pleasures available there. Rivers of wine served in crystal cups, beautiful flowers, beautiful jewels and beautiful girls. For the righteous, says the Quran, there shall be gardens and vineyards and high-bosomed virgins for companions, dark-eyed and bashful, as fair as corals and rubies. Inside here is the caldarium, the hot room, and in here the Umayyad prince would soak himself in hot water, heated up by all those gubbins we saw outside. And as he lay here in his bath, the Umayyad prince would stare up at the dome where he'd see something wondrous, an evocation of the stars at night. This is the earliest known Islamic star chart painted onto the dome at Qasir Amra. 
around the edge are the 12 signs of the zodiac. And in the middle, frescoed representations of the constellations. The Great Bear. The Little Bear. What a thing to find in an 8th century bathhouse. A fabulous image of the heavens at night above your head. It's as if someone's taken the roof off the dome and looked out into the sky at night in the desert full of twinkling stars. What a beautiful idea. It takes a bit of getting to Kazir Amra, but I wanted to make it clear right from the start that Islamic art, from its beginnings in the Dark Ages, has this sensuous dimension to it, a relationship to pleasure that you just don't find in other art. Scattered across this great Syrian desert are the remains of fantastical Umayyad palaces, filled once with beautiful mosaics and marvellous colonnades. What tangible sensuousness you find here, in this first Islamic art. These 8th century desert palaces must once have been filled with the accoutrements of pleasure, vases, hangings, plates and cups, almost all of which have disappeared. But in 1986, here in Jordan, they dug up this. It's an 8th century Islamic brazier, and it gives us a tiny hint of what life was like in the Kazir Amra bathhouse. The brazier was used to heat up the prince's room and for burning incense. Originally, there were wheels on it, and it could be wheeled around from room to room to fill them with sweet smells. It's made of iron and bronze. And at the front here, as you can see, there are these arches, a little bit like the ones in Kazir Amra. And inside the arches are scenes of lovemaking and couples canoodling. And it's all so atmospheric and so beautifully done. I mean, look at these eagles at the bottom, the way they've been shaped, their wings, their feathers. This is metalwork of the highest quality. At the four corners, four cuddly nudes prepare to release a small bird into the incense-filled air above them. And there's a floaty feeling to this marvellous metalwork. What a beautiful thing. And the figurative sculptures you see here, the female figures, are again very surprising. Because this is an aspect of Islamic art that was there at the start, that it's very traditional, but which modern Islam often forgets. The beautiful brazier was an object of private delectation. It had no religious purpose. But it's important to remember that sensuality played a role in the art of these times. In the beginning, this was Islamic art too. And this, and this. When joy was called for, Islamic art inspired great joy. And when sobriety was more appropriate, it achieved great sobriety. This is the finest early mosque in Cairo, the mosque of Ibn Tulun. I like everything about it, but most of all, I admire its architectural seriousness. The way you know, as soon as you step in here, that this is a space devoted to important understandings. Ahmed ibn Tulun, who founded this mosque in 879 AD, was the son of a Turkish slave who became governor of Egypt. Originally, the mosque stood at the centre of a new city that Ibn Tulun also founded, the city of Al-Qatai. 
but al Qatai was destroyed in the 10th century. And this is all that's left of it. They say Ibn Tulun chose this site because this is where Noah's Ark came to rest. There was certainly water here. That domed creation in the center is the ablutions fountain, where all Muslims must wash themselves before prayers. All mosques, and not just this one, are based on the very first mosque, which was the Prophet's own house in Medina. It was a typical mud-brick dwelling with a courtyard, and in that courtyard, the Prophet's followers would gather to hear him speak. So all these great courtyards of Islam, all of them, are descended directly from the Prophet's own courtyard. Their evocative sparseness is an echo of their origins. And their sun-baked simplicity has been there from the start. The walls that encircle you here are like the walls of the Prophet's own courtyard. Their task is to keep the outside world at bay. And here, at Ibn Tulun, there's actually two sets of walls, a kind of double glazing that separates you from the hustle and bustle out there. I like these playful crenellations arranged along the top as well. They look like paper cutouts, something my daughter might have made. To protect his followers from the sun, the Prophet built a simple shelter at the end of his courtyard with a roof made out of palm branches and leaves. And that simple shelter was the inspiration for these great arcades, which still protect the Prophet's followers from the sun. The shelters in his courtyard were also used as somewhere to meet and discuss community affairs. And that marvellous communal atmosphere of a space with many purposes is something else that survives to this day in the Islamic mosque. The largest covered space was the prayer hall, which was basically the Prophet's own house at the end of the courtyard. And in every prayer hall today, there's a continuation of this marvellous Islamic sense that underneath all this mighty religious architecture, you can still feel the humble presence of the Prophet's own dwelling. These prayer halls are so welcoming. They have a sense of the living room about them, a home from home. Most mosques are square or rectangular in plan. And that's because they're all arranged in relation to this wall here, which is called the Qibla wall. The Qibla wall indicates the direction of Mecca. In Arabic, the word Qibla means direction. And in Muhammad's house, a simple spear stuck in the ground would mark the way to pray. The centre of the Qibla wall is marked by the mihrab, which is always the most ornate part of the wall, usually a niche. And these niches were probably inspired by the culminating niches of Byzantine churches, Christian architecture. And to the right of the mihrab is the minbar, or pulpit. And this is based once again on the Prophet's own house. They say that when Muhammad had gathered so many followers, he could no longer be heard by everyone. He stepped up onto some blocks of wood. And those are the origins of the minbar. How fascinating that all the great mosques of Islam inherited their wonderful clarity, their simplicity, and their underlying sacred geometry. 
from the humble house of the Prophet. Look at all that wonderful stucco work around the arches, all that repetition and variety. This is art used in a different way, not to illustrate something, but to create a visual rhythm. Christian churches are full of pictures that tell you stories. But there are no pictures in these great Islamic interiors. The decoration here communicates in other ways. There's a sense of endlessness to it. It develops in all directions. And it makes you feel part of something that's bigger than you. So there are no pictures. Instead, all the way round runs this Quranic inscription carved into wood. You know, I said this mosque was built on the site where Noah's Ark was said to have come to rest. Well, another story they tell here is that this Quranic inscription is carved on the actual wood from Noah's Ark. At the mosque of Ibn Tulun, the Quranic inscription runs for two kilometers around the building. That's one fifteenth of the entire Quran written up on these walls. This is the word of God in its most sacred and purest form. The power of the word is one of the great creative obsessions of the Dark Ages. And in the Metropolitan Museum in New York, the most beguiling of the first Korans, the so-called blue Koran turns the words of God into such glorious art. <laughs> Don't know if you remember the building of the Aswan Dam in the 1960s. It was rather controversial the president of Egypt, President Nasser, joined up with the Russians to build a dam across the Nile. And various archaeological sites were lost forever or had to be moved to new locations, stone by stone. All sorts of ecological disasters were predicted for the dam, most of which haven't happened. The conquest of water was another of Islam's great achievements in the Dark Ages. In Cairo, the Nile would overflow its banks every summer, and the agriculture of the entire Nile Delta depended on the success of this fertile flooding. Thick black silt, rich with nutrients, would be deposited across the floodplain, ensuring a splendid harvest. That was in the good years. In the bad years, the levels were either too low, which meant disaster, or too high, which also meant disaster. The Aswan Dam was built to control that process. So, you might wonder, what did they do before? In Islamic times, they used this the celebrated Nilometer of Rhoda Island on the Nile. Opened for business in 861 AD, it's one of the oldest Islamic monuments in Egypt. And what dramatic evidence it offers of the aquatic brilliance of Islam's engineers. What this thing does is measure the height of the Nile flood. It's basically a big well sunk some 10 metres under the level of the river. In the middle is an octagonal marble column, a kind of giant ruler, which, as you can see, is marked off at different heights. The measurements are in cubits, and one cubit is about half a metre. So around 16 cubits is the perfect flood. Fertile, controllable. Below 16 cubits, there's not enough water. So famine conditions ahead. And higher up, once you get past 19 cubits, 
That's really bad. A catastrophic flood. The Islamic authorities in Cairo used the great nylometer to calculate their annual tax demands. The perfect flood meant perfect profits ahead. Thus, this brilliant piece of design was an early Islamic alternative to the pocket calculator. Before they built the Aswan Dam, these tunnels here led off into the Nile at three different levels. So if they weren't closed off now, I would be underwater. And look at those pointed arches above the tunnels. I mean, that's pure Gothic, 400 years early. The Nilometer was designed by the famed Persian astronomer Abul Abbas Ahmed ibn Muhammad ibn Katir al-Fagani, better known to us by his Latin name, Alfraganus. Alfraganus's most famous achievement as an astronomer was calculating the diameter of the Earth. Copernicus was said to have used his results. And there's even a crater on the moon named after him, the Alfraganus Crater. But it isn't just science that created this, and it isn't just commerce either. All the way round, there are also these beautiful Quranic inscriptions in a lovely Kufic script. Thou seest the earth barren and lifeless, it says, at the 17 cubit mark. But when we pour rain on it, it is stirred to life. At the Nilometer in Cairo, science, commerce and faith have combined in a uniquely Islamic fashion to create a technological wonder. This entire series is about how the Dark Ages weren't dark. But sometimes I should just shut up and let you see the proof for yourselves, because it couldn't be more obvious. This is Karawan in Tunisia. Once this was a city of enormous power, the most important Islamic outpost in North Africa. Now, it's a marvellous place to visit for any true student of the Dark Ages. Karawan, they say, was founded by the great Arab warrior, Sidi Okba ibn Nafi, who conquered these parts for Islam just 50 years after the death of the Prophet. When Sidi Okba got here, this was all desert. But something made him pause and look down at his feet. When Sidi looked down, he saw a miraculous spring of fresh water bubbling up. And in that water, a golden cup, which he'd lost many years before at the Holy Spring in Mecca. The underground waters seemed to have carried it here, so it was clearly a sign. And on this holy spot, Sidi Okba founded Karawan. At the centre of the new city, he built a new mosque, the oldest such mosque in North Africa. From the outside, there's not much sign of it. Islam isn't a religion that flaunts itself in the streets. But when you get inside, into the great courtyard of the Sidi Okba Mosque, what a powerful sight awaits you. Another practical use for these great mosque courtyards, particularly here in Kerouan, where it's so dry, is for collecting water. When it rains, all the water is channeled down here to the centre. And see these decorative openings? They actually have a practical purpose. When the water flows through them, all these arabesques, they actually filter out the impurities, the dust, the feathers. And then the water, pure and clean, is saved below in two giant cisterns so all of Kerouan can make use of it. 
because it was built from nothing, Karawan is a particularly pure Islamic city. There are few traces here of the Romans or the Vandals or the Byzantines. In Karawan, Islam started from scratch. Except here in the courtyard of the mosque. I mean, look at this column, look at the top. What is that, Corinthian? Next to it, I don't know, Phoenician? Over here, Roman perhaps? Could even be Egyptian, who knows? Of the 414 columns arranged around this great courtyard of the mosque in Kerouan, no two are the same. Every column is different. That's because they were all taken from other people's temples and palaces and city halls. This entire mosque was built from bits and pieces of other ancient buildings. In the old days, it was actually forbidden to count the columns in here. Anyone caught doing it was blinded. If you look closely, you find some really surprising things about this courtyard. For example, up here is a Christian cross. So this column must have come from a Byzantine church. But through some miracle of architectural power, despite all this busy borrowing, the end result is an unmistakable sense of Islamic unity. This space could have come from nowhere else. This is unmistakably an Islamic space. There are many remarkable things about the Karawan Mosque. But particularly remarkable, I think, is the proof that is offered here that architecture is an art form of spaces, not of details. Of courtyards, not of capitals. See the tower here? It's got these slabs of stone at the base with Latin inscriptions on them. See this one here? It's upside down. So these must have come from a Roman building. This is actually the oldest surviving Islamic minaret, and it's got a bulky, militaristic presence, rising up in these three squat pieces. But, like all minarets, its original purpose is glorious, to spread the word, to share the news, to shine a light. The minaret is one of the defining Islamic achievements of the Dark Ages. Islam did much that was inventive and progressive in architecture, but in its minarets, it surpassed itself. This word minaret comes from the Arabic manara, which means lighthouse, and that's its function, to be a beacon of hope, to offer safety and protection. And, of course, the faithful were called to prayer from up there. In the very first mosque, built by Muhammad, the faithful were called from the rooftops. But as cities got bigger, mosques got bigger, you needed somewhere higher up from which to broadcast the faith. And look what inventive shapes were found for this conquest of the sky. This is the minaret of the Great Mosque of Samara in Iraq. Its nickname, for obvious reasons, is the snail shell. No one else in the Dark Ages built anything as aerially ambitious as this. And it wasn't just the mosques. This extraordinary brick masterpiece in Iran is the tomb of the Zirayad prince Kabus ibn Vashimgir. It's a thousand years old, but looks like something the Bauhaus might have come up with, don't you think? Inside, Kabus had himself suspended at his death in a coffin of pure rock crystal. What a thrilling Islamic conquest of the heavens.
speaking of rock crystal, it's a very special substance, isn't it? According to the Quran, when the chosen arrive in paradise, they'll be given drinks of ginger, served in goblets of crystal. Crystal, or rock crystal to be more specific, was a substance with which Islam seemed to have a special affinity. They say it was Ahmed ibn Tulun himself who introduced the art of carving rock crystals into Egypt. And what's certain is that it was in Egypt that this difficult art reached perfection. I don't know about you, but I can't think of many substances in the world with a presence as magical as rock crystal. Particularly when it has passed through the hands of the master carvers of Islam. Only a handful of these gorgeous Islamic ewers have survived. And that just makes them feel even more precious. Rock crystal itself is actually very common. It's just a type of quartz, and quartz is the most common mineral in the Earth's crust. You get it everywhere. Look, there's a stripe of it here. What isn't common is pieces of quartz so pure and perfect and transparent that they satisfied the demands of the great crystal carvers of Islam. No one has ever carved rock crystal more finely than this. What they do is find a perfect lump of crystal and shape it on the outside and then begin hollowing out the inside. And they'd hollow it further and further and further till in the very best Islamic art, the walls of the crystal were only a couple of millimetres thick. Now that was unbelievably difficult. The shimmering images carved into these gorgeous crystal ewers would transport the drinker to paradise. Hunting scenes, flowers, beautiful birds, so crystal clear that none could resist them. And it wasn't just Islam that saw something magical in this rock crystal. In Ireland, when Ireland was still pagan, they used to put pieces of rock crystal at the entrance of the burial chambers. And in Egypt, they carved it into perfect spheres, which apparently kept your hands cool when you touched it. And of course, it was used for telling the future. And it still is. All sorts of Dark Age societies were fascinated by rock crystal. The Roman naturalist Pliny the Elder believed that rock crystal was actually frozen water, trapped for eons under the glaciers. Even the early Christians worshipped it. For them, rock crystal had a natural relationship with divine perfection. So they put it on the outside of their reliquaries and up in their golden crosses, where its perfect presence seemed somehow to connect them to God. Christian rock crystal has a different feel to it. In Christian hands, the light-filled paradise of Islam seemed to fill up with shadows. With Christian rock crystal, the Dark Ages are what you expect them to be. Mysterious, spooky and talismanic. The water engineers of Islam perfected their hydraulic skills in lands where water was precious and rare. So their relationship to it had something of the dream about it. For Islam, water wasn't just a necessity, it was an enticement too. 
This is Cordoba in Spain. The Muslim armies got here in 711 AD and conquered it from the Visigoths. Remember them from the last film. And when Islam arrived in Spain, it could not believe how fertile this new territory was, how full of paradisical waters. This is the Guadalhivir in Andalusia, the largest navigable river in Spain. The name is Islamic. It comes from Al-Wadi Al-Kabir, which means the Great Valley. These days, the Guadalhivir River is only navigable up to Seville. But in Islamic times, you could sail all the way up here to Cordoba. And in this great city, Islamic water architecture surpassed itself. All along the Guadalhivir, a cunning system of mills, dams and water wheels channeled the energy of the waters. The water wheels of Cordoba lifted water from the river high up to the bank, where the gardeners of Islam used it to recreate paradise on Earth. This isn't actually an Islamic garden. It's an Islamic-style garden built by the Christian kings here in Cordoba. Unfortunately, the original Islamic garden has disappeared. But Islam was here for 500 years. So this style of garden making is ingrained in the culture. And what you still get here is a vivid sense of how the Islamic garden felt. Fountains, waterways, flowers. These are the divine atmospheres of those magical paradisical mosaics we saw in the great mosque at Damascus. Except this time, they're real. To enter the mosque at Cordoba, you need to pass through another beautiful evocation of the paradise ahead. An orange grove, so divinely harmonious. This was obviously a very desirable location. They say there was a Visigoth church here originally. And later, when the Muslims were finally kicked out of Spain, a Catholic cathedral was plonked in the middle of the mosque, creating this ungainly hybrid. It was the Umayyad prince, Abdul Rahman I, who began building the Cordoba Mosque. He actually bought the land from the Christians. And in those early days of religious tolerance, Muslims and Christians shared the building. The Cordoba Mosque is famous for its columns. 856 of them like rows of palm trees in the oasis of Syria, is how someone's described them. Columns are very laborious to make, and they use up a lot of precious stone, so they're very heavy. And if you can avoid making them, you will. For the Cordoba Mosque, the columns came from the Visigoth church that was there before, and also from nearby Roman temples. But these reused Visigoth columns weren't quite tall enough. So to make the Cordoba Mosque higher and more airy, the architects of Islam came up with a brilliant new idea, the double arch. Two arches for the price of one. At the bottom, the horseshoe arch, borrowed, as we saw in the last film, from the Visigoths. Then, on top of that, a round arch, arch number two, making the mosque taller, less solid-looking, more see-through. For the first time in European architecture, the aesthetics of light were shaping a building. You know, Cordoba, when the Muslims were here, had half a million people living in it. 
It is by far the largest and most prosperous city in Western Europe. And all of those inhabitants had running water. They had toilets that flushed street lamps in the 10th century. In urban planning, architecture, mathematics and water engineering, Islamic knowledge was peerless. And in one area, it was spectacular. Astronomy, the study of the stars. 90% of the 200 brightest stars in the sky have Arabic names. Vega, Betelgeuse, Algol, Deneb. They're all creations of the Dark Ages because Arabic astronomy allowed the Dark Ages to glimpse the cosmos. Remember those stars painted onto the roof at the palace in Kazir Amra? Well, that was just the beginning. While Christian science was insisting on a backward, biblical understanding of the cosmos, Islamic science was investigating the heavens more adventurously. This little baby here, the astrolabe, has been called the first computer. It was developed to pinpoint the direction of Mecca. Muslims needed to pray five times a day in a specific direction at specific times. The astrolabe could work all that out in relation to the stars. So this was the first compass as well and the first clock. So the way it works, the first thing you need to do is decide on which star you want to focus on. And I'm going to choose Vega. So I find Vega in the sky, and with these sights here, I line it up until I can see Vega in the middle. It's exactly there. And that gives me a reading here in degrees, degrees from the horizontal. So I can see that Vega right now is 35 degrees. So the next thing to do is to set the date, measured of course in the old fashioned way, in phases of the zodiac. Right now we're in Gemini, so in fact we're in the 15th degree of Gemini, about there, otherwise known as the end of May. So this is basically that in diagrammatic form. And whatever is true on here is also true out there. So I know the date, I know where Vega is. So, with the help of this handy Dark Age sat-nav, I can finally work out where I am. It was Alfred Gainus, the multi-skilled designer of the Nilometer in Cairo, who undertook the first great Islamic exploration of the stars. He was followed by many others. Without Islamic science and its sensuous delight in the cosmos, perhaps this really would have been a dark age. With Islamic science, it was anything but. In the next film, we'll be heading north to celebrate those fine craftsmen, the Vikings and to investigate those particularly skilled jewellers of the Dark Ages, the Anglo-Saxons. Simon Sebag Montefiore's brand new series, Rome, A History of the Eternal City, continues here on BBC4 tomorrow night as Rome picked up the mantle of the head of Western Christendom at nine. And if you missed the first part, never fear, there's a chance to catch up with that next. <laughs>